This morning, we're going to be in the book of Jonah, uh, which is in the Old Testament. Uh, So if you do have a Bible with you, I encourage you to to flip there. We're going to be studying uh, the first chapter this morning. Uh, But before we dive in, uh, let me pray for us, invite the Lord to to reveal his word to us. Uh, So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, the privilege it is to gather with your people, uh, to worship you, to have the freedom to uh, proclaim your gospel, to study your word together. We thank you for the many uh, resources that we have to study the Bible, uh, the ways that we can even be connected uh, virtually online uh, to other believers. We ask that you would use your word this morning to encourage us, to challenge us, uh, to to sharpen us, uh, to more faithful followers of you. We ask uh, that your Holy Spirit would be present for he illumines your word to us. He convicts us. Use uh, my words this morning to um, faithfully uh, proclaim your message. And so, Father, we ask that you would be with us now, and we ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So as I said, we're going to be in the the book of Jonah in chapter one. Uh, And this is uh, just kind of a quick outline. You can see uh, we're going to have three main points to kind of help uh, organize our thoughts, but we'll, we'll get back to that as well. So first, let me just read the passage for us, uh, just so that we kind of get a good overview uh, of what we're going to be talking about. This is a very familiar passage, uh, I assume, for many people, uh, but I think uh, there's still richness in it that we can can uh, gain. So Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 17 say, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is it that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. May God bless the reading of his word. What comes to mind when I say the word obedience? Maybe you think of training a dog to obey your commands, or uh, many of you are parents. You think of your own children and the way Uh, that it can be a struggle, you know, to teach your kids uh, to obey. 
uh, some of us may just kind of have an instinct to rebel against that term, obedience. It feels very stuffy, very strict, very forced, especially as you grow older and you don't have parents around to obey anymore. You don't have those authorities. Obedience is a concept that we have in our lives from an early age. It's throughout the Bible as well. Uh, but because of that repetition, or maybe in spite of it, uh, it can be easy for us to misunderstand it or to take it for granted. And so if you don't remember anything else from today, uh, I want you to remember this, that those who know who God is, obey him. If you know who God is, you're going to obey him. And so while the Bible has really inspiring uh, examples throughout of, of heroes of the faith, people who do obey God, people who are faithful uh, to his word, Jonah is not really one of those examples, right? If we look at our passage this morning, uh, we begin by seeing that Jonah serves as a really good example in many ways of how not uh, to obey God. As one commentator uh, put it, Jonah thought that he knew God and that he could disobey, but he doesn't know God, and ultimately he can't disobey, and that's what we see in our passage this morning. Now, you uh, are probably pretty familiar with the book of Jonah. It's, a, it's something that we teach little kids, Jonah and the whale, even though, uh, as we see in our passage, it actually talks about a fish, not necessarily a whale. But whether you've grown up hearing this story in Sunday school, or if you've not really been familiar with this story before, um, it has all the elements of a really exciting story, right? There's a dangerous storm. Uh, there's this miraculous rescue. Uh, in chapter four, there's a very hungry worm that uh, eats Jonah's beloved plant. It's a really unique book uh, in the Bible. It's only 48 verses long in all four chapters. Uh, in my Bible, it fits on just two pages. Um, so you may be wondering, why, why would you include a book like this? It's, it's one of the minor prophets, which uh, just means that it's one of the shorter books of prophecy that we have. Right? It's not that it's less important than the major prophets. Um, but despite its short length, despite that it's only these 48 verses in our Bible, Jonah is a really rich story about God's immense sovereignty, his perfect judgment, uh, and his abounding grace. I really do love this book. I think it's uh, a very special book uh, that God has included in his word to really show um, many things, his love for the nations beyond just Israel. Uh, Jesus points to the book of Jonah uh, and uses it as a sign, right, that he would die and three days later would be resurrected, just as Jonah was in the fish for three days and nights. But if we look at the person, the character, Jonah himself, this book is a sort of obedience school that God uses in Jonah's life to teach him who he really is, and what it really means to follow him. So who was Jonah? Uh, Jonah was a prophet. Uh, and as a prophet, his role was to be God's mouthpiece, uh, to communicate important messages, um, sometimes mostly to Israel and to Judah, if we go through uh, the Old Testament. But sometimes uh, God sent prophets to proclaim messages to other nations. And Jonah is one example. He's sent to the Assyrians. So when we read a book in the, in the prophets, they're filled with God's word. We see the word of the Lord came to Micah or the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, right? And these are introductions that tune us uh, to focus on the message. This is God speaking to us. And the book of Jonah begins much the same way, right? So if, if you do have your Bibles open, I, I invite you to follow along with me as we kind of work our way through the text this morning. Uh, Jonah chapter one, verse one says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So this follows the pattern of a lot of other books uh, in the Old Testament. God calls his prophet. God delivers his message. It is clear that Jonah has a task. It's no, you know, he knows where to go. He knows what to do and what to say. However, this is where, after this, uh, Jonah takes a really marked turn from the rest of the prophets. In verse three, we're told, but, right? 
God calls his prophet to deliver a message, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so from this point on, our focus is shifted from what God is saying, what God's word is proclaiming, to the way that God addresses in Jonah's heart really deep issues and deep misunderstandings about his character. And so in a way, Jonah, unlike most of the other prophets, has made himself the main character. You know, in Micah, Micah is not the main character, it is God. And Jonah, in his disobedience, forces the story upon himself. And so this morning, as we work our way through the text, I want us to see three reasons, three exhortations for why we ought to obey God. The first exhortation comes from our first three verses. It's that we ought to obey God because he is good. Obey God because he is good. Those who know God, know his character, are going to obey him. And we're going to see these three attributes of God that encourage us to obey him. And so at the beginning of this book, we find ourselves wondering, why does Jonah run, right? We are told that he runs, that he flees from God, but we're not told why. What is all that about? Why is he going to such lengths? He's going on the ship, he's traveling, he's you know, trying to get as far away as possible. And we don't find the answer to that until the end of the book. And so to better understand why Jonah reacts so strongly, there's a couple things that I think we, we ought to know. Uh, the first is a little bit of historical context for the book of Jonah. Uh, Jonah is mentioned actually in one other place in the Old Testament, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 14. This is right on the heels of Elijah and Elisha, these great prophets uh, who follow God faithfully. And we're told that one of the prophecies that Jonah delivered from God was fulfilled under King Jeroboam II in the 8th century BC. And during this time, this, the powerful Assyrian empire was this looming reminder that Israel could be wiped off the map. One historian puts it this way, Babylon may be a by name for corruption, uh, corruption, decadence, and sin, but the Assyrians and their famous rulers with terrifying names like Shalmaneser, Tiglath-Pileser, Sennacherib, they rate in popular imagination just below Adolf Hitler and Genghis Khan for cruelty, violence, and sheer murderous savagery. These are the enemies of Israel, and this is the threat that Israel is facing from the Assyrians. And so Jeroboam II's grandfather would have been forced to pay tribute to Assyria. And by the end of that century, uh, Assyria would invade and destroy the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And so for Jonah to be called to Nineveh, the capital city of this enemy empire, was a really hard pill to swallow. Just imagine that for a moment. This enemy country that threatens to kill and destroy everything that you love, everyone that you know, you're called to preach to this country, to the capital city, to go by yourself. The second thing that we should know that kind of helps us to understand Jonah's reaction is to understand why God sends prophets. In verse two, Jonah, is told to call out against the city of Nineveh, for their evil had come up before the Lord. God was aware of the evil of the Assyrian Empire. He saw the evil uh, in the Ninevites, and Jonah was sent to call out against them. And so for many of us, that sounds like, oh, like God is paying attention. God is, is going to bring judgment, right, on the Assyrians. He's, it's finally time for him to smite Nineveh, to smite the Assyrians and wipe them off the face of the planet. But this wasn't really God's intent when he sent prophets. So Jonah, instead of gleefully telling Nineveh that they're all going to die because of how evil and terrible they are, he runs away from God. So if we look, um, and we don't really get a clear answer, like I mentioned, about why until chapter four. Jonah spends these three days and nights in the belly of a fish, and eventually, when G Jonah does go to preach to Nineveh, the entire city repents and believes in the Lord, begging for mercy from God. Listen to Jonah's prayer 
in chapter 4, verse 2. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Here it is. This is the reason that he fled. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Do you get that? Did you catch that? Jonah says that he ran from God because he knew that God is merciful. He knew that God might spare the people that Jonah hated. He knew that if he preached to Nineveh, if he delivered God's word, there was a possibility that God might be gracious to them, that God might forgive them. And so that was enough for Jonah to run away. He couldn't stand that idea. God doesn't send his prophets to destroy. He doesn't send us his word to condemn so that we only understand our sin. It's what God communicates to Israel later through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 18 of his uh, prophet. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck it up uh, and break it down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I've spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do it. So God's intention, God's the whole point of sending prophets to Israel, to Judah, to these foreign nations, is not so that God can say, I told you so, uh, when he obliterates them. No, that's not, that's not it at all. God sends prophets to call people to repent from evil and return to a right relationship with himself. So there's a lot more that we could unpack there, uh, and I hope we do have the chance uh, another day to do that. But um, back to the story of Jonah. At the heart of Jonah's flight is the simple fact that he does not like what God is commanding him to do, right? It doesn't really matter all the reasons, all the background. He doesn't like what God is telling him to do. Jonah receives a command from God. He doesn't like it, and so he runs away. He rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And you and I, if you follow Christ long enough, a day even, you'll find things, find some things of God perhaps unpalatable. You will find things unwelcome. You find some instruction dis distasteful. So what do we do when God asks us to do something that we don't like, that we don't agree with? If we read his word and we find something that makes us tense up a little bit, something that doesn't sit well with us. There are a few common ways that we tend to respond to these sorts of unsavory instructions that we find in God's word. And the first is that we just ignore it, just like Jonah did, fleeing from the presence of the Lord. For us, it probably doesn't mean that we actually run away to Tarshish. We don't get on a plane, right, to run away from God. Uh, we don't put our fingers in our ears, but perhaps we avoid situations where God's word is taught faithfully. Perhaps a sermon is preached or we read a passage of scripture that we don't like. And maybe we just take a break from those things for a while. We just ignore it. We don't spend time with God. We don't invite his spirit to examine our hearts, to convict us of sin we too, just like Jonah, can ignore God's commands. And a second way that we often uh, respond to unwanted instruction from God is to just reinterpret what he's saying so that it's acceptable to us. Perhaps we question whether we really understand uh, what he is saying. Does God really want me to do that? Isn't that a little extreme? From Adam's temptation in Eden, to Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, to living here in the Bay Area today, the enemy will twist God's words and make you wonder, does God actually want me to do that? Isn't that unwise or impractical? Surely God doesn't expect me to live without sex until I'm married. That seems crazy. That seems wild. I mean, 
Has, he, has God ever been a teen or a young adult? You know, has, he, has he understood what it means to be me? Church, people will always use scripture to justify what they want, and that is dangerous. But it's not the same thing as followers of Christ to say, what do you have for me to do today, Father? How can I follow you faithfully? We can ignore God. We interpret what he says. A final way that we tend to react to things that we don't like from God's word is perhaps the easiest trap to fall into and one that I want to exhort you to this morning. We obey God, but we don't really want to. We feel somber and sullen in the face of obedience. We put on sackcloth and ashes and say, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm going to obey. I'm going to do what you say, but I'm not going to like it. I'm not going to appreciate it. I want you to just for a second compare that attitude that I think is very easy and common to fall into with the way that Psalm 19 describes God's commands. And if you would, just keep a, a finger on where we are in Jonah, but do turn with me to Psalm 19. It should just be a few pages to the left, near the middle. As I read verses 7 through 10, and if you're there in Psalm 19, you can follow along. Think about how David describes what God's commands are like, starting in verse 7 of, of Psalm 19. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. I mean, wow, <laughs> that more to be desired than gold. Has the psalmist seen what housing prices are like here in the Bay Area, that that would be following God's word, his instruction would be more precious than all the wealth that we can accumulate? How can the, Lord, how can the law of the Lord be sweeter than honey when sometimes following God is awkward or difficult or costly, inconvenient, painful? Sam Albury is a pastor in England who understands the high cost of following Jesus. And in response to this question, says this, God knows us better than we know ourselves. He loves us more than we love ourselves. He's more committed to our ultimate joy than even we are. And therefore, we can trust him when he does call us to obey in ways that feel hard, inconvenient, painful. Can you imagine what that, how that would change your outlook on obedience, on obeying God? And how would that change our responses to commands that we don't like? God's law is more to be desired than gold because God himself is more to be desired than gold. They're sweeter than honey because God is the sweetest, most satisfying joy that we can experience. God doesn't want your <clears throat> obedience apart from your love for him. He desires mercy and your loyal love more than sacrifice. So what instruction could come from a good God except good instruction? Jonah did not trust that God wanted better for him than he did himself. So what about you? Will you respond like Jonah did? Or will you trust God? Those who know God, <clears throat> who know his goodness, will obey him. As we go through the rest of the text, I want us to next see that we ought to obey God because he is in control. We can obey God because he is good. His law is good. We can also obey him because he is in control. <clears throat> 
If you follow along with me in this next section, what I want us to do is just take notice in this text of all the ways that we are reminded that it is God who is in ultimate control over Jonah's life. God calls Jonah to preach to Nineveh. Jonah responds by running away. But now God responds in verse four. Follow with me there. It says, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah's planned escape, it's not going very well. God causes this huge storm to come on the sea. It wasn't just a light rain. It was so intense that these sailors who are professionals, they've been on the sea their entire lives. They are panicked. They are thinking that they are going to drown, that they're, uh, they're going to capsize. They're panicking for their lives. And so just as God hurled this storm on the water, in Hebrew, these sailors are hurling everything off the boat just to get it up out of the water so that it might not sink. This is their livelihood. They are giving up all of their money that they would have made on this trip just so that they might survive. But what is Jonah doing amidst all of that chaos? He is sleeping. It's an amazing skill. I don't know about you. This, is, this man is a very deep sleeper, but he's about to get a very rude awakening, both literally and figuratively. And so we're told in verse six that the captain comes to find him. What do you mean, you sleeper? He is, he cannot believe that these men are trying to save their lives and Jonah has just taken a nap. Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. This probably didn't feel very good to Jonah. Uh, would have reminded him of all of the commands that he was running from. In fact, it's the same language that God uses. Arise, go to Nineveh. And then the captain says, arise, call out to your God. We can't escape that irony that Jonah, the prophet, this professional listener and follower of God's word, is reminded by this complete pagan sailor, doesn't know God, doesn't honor God, he's not from Israel. That sailor is the one who reminds him to seek God in prayer. That sailor uh, is the one who tells him to return to God. Jonah had been avoiding God. And in this section, we see that God won't let him do that. The sailors get the impression that this isn't just an ordinary event. So they begin to, under, they begin to question, maybe someone on the boat has caused a God to be upset. And this is why this is all happening. And so they cast lots uh, to find out who the guilty party is. And this usually just involved simple dice that maybe had a dark side and a light side to it for yes or no questions and answers. So is the person in this group on the left or are they on this group on the right? And then you just kind of whittle down until you find out exactly who, who it is. God is in control, even in this game of, of chance, of heads or tails. And so the lot, we're told, falls on to Jonah. Jonah is the responsible party. And the sailors berate him with all these questions, right? Who, what is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? This is like speed dating with just high life and death stakes, right? He's trying to figure out exactly why, who is upset and why. But look with me at verse nine. How does Jonah reply to all these questions? I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Given the context of this book, that he's running away from these enemies of Israel, it's interesting to see that Jonah's gut response is to stand behind his ethnicity as a Hebrew. And so his second response rings a little hollow. I fear the Lord. Really? You know, what, what in this book have we seen thus far that tells us that God, that Jonah actually fears the Lord? He's not really acting like it. But this response terrifies the sailors because Jonah had already told them that he was trying to run away from the Lord, from Yahweh. And so they ask him what they need to do to, to address the situation. And Jonah simply says, throw me into the ocean, throw me into the sea. 
pick me up, hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it's because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah is very lucky that I wasn't one of the sailors because I probably would have just listened to him. I would have happily thrown him into the ocean if that's, if that's what it took. I would have happily indulged him. You know, we've found this man who's, gonna ma who's made us lose all our cargo, who's put us in harm's way. We're going to lose our lives, potentially. And he's just told us that the solution is to throw him overboard. Why not? Why not do it? But I want you to see in verse 13, we're told that instead, the men rode hard to get back to shore. And when the storm continued to get worse, they cried out to God in verse 14, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Jonah of all people on this boat should know that we can't really run from God. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? The psalmist says, Jonah should know that God is sovereign, meaning that there's not a single thing that happens on earth that's outside of his purview, outside of his view. There's not, nothing unnoticed by him, not a surprise vacation to Tarshish, or even a man sleeping below deck on a small little boat in the middle of the sea. Jonah should have known that. And yet, in our passage, we see that the least likely people here, these pagan sailors, are the first ones to seek God's will in prayer. And it's the sailors who show Jonah mercy by trying to row back to shore and not immediately throwing him overboard and sentencing him to death. But Jonah is pouty, and he would rather embrace death than humble himself in prayer before God. Do you see that Jonah doesn't even try to ask for God's forgiveness? He just says, throw me overboard, right? I would rather die than to recognize that I've sinned, that I've erred, that I need to come to God and ask for his mercy. He just would rather die. We too lose sight of the fact that God is the one who made the sea and the dry land and that we are his creation. If you've ever had a disagreement with your parents or with your kids, you may have heard this phrase, because I said so. Uh, it kind of kills all discussions, right? Uh, why can't I go to this party tonight, mom? Because I said so. <laughs> why do I have to clean my room? Because I said so. And at the core of that, you're saying I have the final say, I have authority over you. And sometimes it is instructive for us to remember that God does have the final say over us. God does have that authority. And I say that with caution just because the Bible does say that disobedience without love is meaningless, but God is in control. He is good. And so if anything, the sovereignty, the control that we see throughout this chapter ought to bring us peace, ought to bring us comfort, that God is in control, that he does all things well. But that's not the way that we live often. We might know in theory that God is powerful, but that doesn't stop us from thinking that we are the ones that make our careers flourish, or our families thrive, or bring peace to our relationships. We might know in theory that God is loving, but that doesn't stop us from losing our temper with our family or our friends. But I want you to see that God isn't let Jonah running away quietly. He doesn't let Jonah die when Jonah wants to just be thrown into the sea. God is the one who hurled the storm on the water. God directed the waters to subside. God appointed a fish to eventually rescue Jonah from drowning. Jonah doesn't really upstage God by disobeying. The Lord is still in control. He's still sovereign. Just like the sailors say in verse 14, God has done as it pleased him even if that means dragging Jonah through the next three chapters of this book to understand that and to really get that. And this story should remind us of another man hundreds of years later 
whose followers were panicking in the middle of a storm on a boat. Jesus was lying fast asleep, but when he was woken up, he silenced the waves and the winds obeyed him. Those who know who God is, who the sovereign king over the universe is, will obey him, even if it's just the winds and the waves. So far in Jonah, we've seen uh, an exhortation to obey God because he is good and his law is good. And we've seen throughout this narrative that we ought to obey God because he is in control. He's sovereign. We cannot run away from that. And lastly, uh, what I want us to see in our passage this morning is an exhortation to obey God because he is merciful even when we disobey. The book of Jonah could easily have ended at verse three. The Lord called Jonah to preach. <clears throat> Jonah runs away and the Lord smote Jonah. That is a way that that book could have gone. The end, God would have been completely loving and justified, completely right to do that. And yet, God is so patient with Jonah to take him on this crazy, incredible journey in order to teach him the depths of God's mercy. And along the way, God shows these sailors his power firsthand. And in verse 16, we see that because of all of this, those sailors, those pagan sailors, feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows. Does this mean that all of a sudden they were monotheists, that they were followers of Yahweh, completely changed? Maybe not. We don't know for sure. But these men who experienced God's power firsthand in front of their eyes, they couldn't help but worship God. But what does God do with Jonah himself? The Lord is still at work. Verse 17 tells us that God appointed uh, another view into his sovereignty. He appoints a great fish to swallow up Jonah, who is there for three days and three nights. This move surprises Jonah. He was prepared to die. And just like the prodigal son, who is sure that he won't be accepted by his father, when drowning seems like a guarantee for Jonah, God rescues him. And God is still not done. He's going to continue to use Jonah and his disobedience to bless others, including the entire nation of Assyria. He causes this massive city to repent from evil which serves the testimony to us even today. Those who know God uh, will obey him. But how do we do that this morning? How do we learn to obey God more faithfully? How do we have the zeal to follow him? We sometimes think of learning obedience as simply disobeying less. You are more obedient if you're less disobedient. But if we sin less, are we necessarily being obedient? In the New Testament book of Hebrews, the author says this about Jesus in chapter 5, verse 8. Although he, Jesus, was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So what does it mean that Jesus the perfect son of God, learned obedience. John Piper explains that Jesus learned obedience, not in the sense that he moved from disobedience to obedience. That's how we often think of it. Sinning less, and it means obedience. But instead, what Hebrews is telling us is that Jesus moved from untested, untried obedience to fully tested fully tried obedience. So Jesus was tempted to abandon God's plan, even when it was uncomfortable, when it would eventually be lethal to him. But in each of those instances, he chose to trust the Father. And in that, through that, learned obedience. Anticipating the cross, he said, Father, if there's another way to do this, that is what I would prefer. Right? That's the prayer that he gives in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he ultimately says, your will be done, not mine. That is fully tested, fully tried 
obedience. If you've trained in school, some of you are still in school. If you've had children and raised them, if you've worked, there are years of training in each of those instances. As a school, you learn and study for years and years. If you raise children, you feed them, clothe them, wash them day in, day out. Those are the small steps of obedience, uh, small steps of, of training that make it possible for you to face kind of the big challenges, right? You don't take the SAT as a kindergartner. You spend years training for that, right? You don't have difficult conversations with your kids right out of the gate. It's through years of small conversations, small uh, ways of teaching. And so in a similar way, we learn to obey God precisely when we feel stretched, when we feel strained. Do you obey God like that? Can you look back and see the times that maybe you didn't like God's word and chose to obey him and trust him nevertheless? So learning obedience is, is not, as, not as much about doing less bad or avoiding sin. That's simple. Learning obedience is about saying yes to the good things that God has called us to. It means yes, it means that we're going to say no to sinful desires, temptations. But when we obey, we are ex exercising an act of faith that God's guidance is good because God himself is good. The Bible explains that those who have salvation in Jesus obey him. That's what we saw in Hebrews. They don't have salvation because they obey him, but those two things cannot be separated. Jonah missed an opportunity to trust God. That's what we see in this first chapter. He missed the mark, and that is what the Bible calls sin. But praise God that he was not allowed to succeed in running away. Praise God that he wasn't left to mope, to wallow, Praise God that while Jonah was willing to die for his disobedience, that Jesus was willing to die for the sake of his obedience. Those who know God are going to trust him. Those who know God are going to obey him. I hope that you do know God. I hope that you are a follower of Jesus. I implore you, if you are or if you are not, to seek out the Lord the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. The Bible teaches that all will obey him, whether willingly through a response to his spirit in this life, or when we all stand before him at the judgment seat in heaven. And so if God is prom prompting you to respond to him this morning, I encourage you to let this be the first or the hundredth time that you say yes to how he is leading. So if you have been following him for a long time, may Jonah remind you of the impressive, that an impressive spiritual resume doesn't prevent us from being blind to the depths of God's holiness, God's kindness. If you aren't growing in your knowledge, in your intimacy with the Lord, if your obedience is never tested, perhaps you don't know him as well as you think you might. So I encourage you, I, I ask you to turn to him again this morning. Those who know God will obey him. Jonah chose to flee when, it when obedience seemed difficult, when it seemed challenging. But you and I have the chance this morning to say, Lord, what you're calling me to might not be what I would choose or, or prefer, but I will trust that you are good. So just like the call to Jonah, arise church, know him, and obedience will follow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word. The sweetness that it is, is sweeter than honey and more valuable to us than gold. We ask that you would make those feelings true in our hearts in a more real way this week. We thank you for the example of, of Jonah, 
who is so relatable in many ways. We thank you for the reminder of your sovereignty, that you care for us, that you have a heart that is deeper and more filled with love than, than we can even fully understand. Help us to obey you this week because flowing out of a, a love for you and a trust in the work of your son, Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.